I'm Ellen Ochoa, director of NASA's Johnson Space Center. I'd like to welcome you to today's event. Each year, NASA joins the nation in observing Hispanic Heritage Month. Hispanics have shaped and strengthened the fabric of this country through contributions and accomplishments that span every facet of American society. Here at NASA, we welcome and rely on the diverse backgrounds, perspectives, and ideas of all of our talented workforce. And I'm personally so grateful that I've had the opportunity to be a valued member of the NASA team for almost 30 years, sharing in our joint achievements. The Hispanic Outreach and Leadership Alliance team has assembled a stellar lineup of talent from across the nation. Today's speakers will discuss the importance of Hispanic representation in STEM education and careers and highlight successes and challenges. These are important topics because our future success depends on our ability to continue to attract the best and brightest and then develop our workforce and future leaders. Enjoy the program. Good morning, buenos dias. Thank you so much for being here at NASA headquarters. Welcome, and to those watching online, thank you for joining us. Uh, today we will celebrate uh, Hispanic Heritage Month. Here at NASA, we take a moment to acknowledge the rich history, beauty, diversity, contributions and accomplishments of the Hispanic community across the nation. So I'm so thrilled to have you here today. This is the second year we have planned uh, activities for NASA headquarters. My name is Maria Santos and I'm the chair of the Hispanic Outreach and Leadership Alliance group here, also known as OLA. Um, OLA's mission is basically to foster awareness and promote the contributions of the Hispanic community here at NASA to create and facilitate collaborative cross-cultural opportunities and to encourage the recruitment and professional development of a highly skilled and diverse workforce. So I was thinking, you know, this takes a few months to plan an activity like this, and I kept thinking about what we wanted to focus on this year. Uh, and my team and I were debating um, what the focus should be. But then one day, it just, hit me after reading an article about the U.S. population, the U.S. labor workforce, and the education system in this country. And then it hit me that, hmm, Latinos, stem up. It's time. It's time to stem up, not only uh, because it's a necessity, but it's a social obligation, not only for Hispanics um, in the country, but also across the board, professionals, educators, um, people in the public, uh, private sectors. It's important because uh, Hispanics comprise almost 18% of the US population and growing. Nowadays, uh, about 25% of uh, students in um, K through 12 schools are Hispanics. So that got me thinking, okay, so it's a growing population. And then I looked into it some more, and it's a very young population. It's actually two to three years younger than the average uh, uh, non-Hispanic American. So what does this mean? This basically means that Hispanics will be, uh, have been and will continue to be a great contributor to this uh, country's economic, um, political, educational systems, right? So what are we doing to not only um, encourage Hispanics to go into STEM fields because science, technology, engineering, and mathematics is important, especially for us here at NASA. STEM is what we do. So how do we prepare these students to go into STEM? How do we prepare uh, individuals to grow within those STEM careers as well? So today I'm very excited because we have an amazing panel uh, from across NASA. So this is an agency-wide initiative here, and we also are so thrilled to have um, our, our national professionals here recognized in their fields, in their STEM fields across the country. Uh, so I think you're in for a really good, good uh, panel discussion here. I hope you enjoy it. Um, but I did want to share a little bit about myself so that you understand where I'm coming from. Um, 
and this is just between us. I haven't really told many people this, right? So I, <laughs> I'm actually an immigrant, so my family moved to the States in the uh, 1980s um, during the civil wars in El Salvador. Uh, so for me, hearing bombs going off in the distance and watching people walk around with you know, uh, rifles was common occurrence. So uh, we left when I was about six years old. Um, I'm the youngest of eight, uh, first to go to college. Um, well, actually, second to go to college because I have a sister who went to uh, uh, a community college, so she actually paved the way. But I say all that to say that when we moved here, we did not know the language. We did not know anyone in this country. We ended up in a tiny little place called Parrish, Florida, south of Tampa, Florida. And um, I didn't know anyone that looked like me that went to college or held a professional career. And it wasn't because I actually had a couple guidance counselors and a lady from the school board who actually believed in me and got me into the Upper Bound program, and um, which changed my life. And so I was then afforded the opportunity to apply and got accepted to different colleges and universities. Well, then the real hurdle came, which was having to tell my mother that her youngest child, female, was going to leave home, right, four hours away. Uh, it was unheard of, and of course she said no, because it's, you know, she's, she didn't understand the importance of having me go off and go to college. So she actually was hearing from my teachers, my guidance counselors, anybody and everybody who could speak to her to try to encourage her to let me go, basically. And my mother said, no, if she wants to study, she can go down the street to the community college. But um, I got full ride, you know, full scholarships, and so they felt my my counselors felt that it would be a waste for me to let that just go. Eventually, my sister, uh, my hero, put her foot down and she said, "No, she's going." She actually packed my stuff in her little car and drove me off to college. My mother would not go to drop me off to college. So I ended up you know, graduating and this and that, and I started my federal career about 10 years ago. And my background is in human resources. So I had access to data, and I was just surprised at the fact that we had this population that kept growing. You know, the research was there, the stats were there, but yet it wasn't representative across federal government. And so I got involved with employee resource groups trying to bring this forward and trying to show, listen, the research is there, the stats are there, there's something that we have to do to prepare, right? We need to look forward and prepare the, the next or the future workforce. So needless to say, nowadays my mother is the biggest advocate for education there is. Anybody and everybody she meets she introduces me as, this is my daughter Maria, she works at NASA, right? And then she talks to every kid that she meets, every young person that she meets, and encourages them to get that education. And so, you know, that's just one story. My story's not unique. I'm sure a lot of us share that story. And I wanted to share it today because, like I said, it's not unique, it's pretty common within the Hispanic community, which is why we have to keep pushing for education, pushing for the importance of going into STEM fields, pushing for um, just preparation in general, um, not only within the uh, Hispanic community, but across federal government, across this nation. Now, um, I'm so excited to have actually Mr. Elvis Cordova moderate this uh, panel discussion for me today. I actually know Elvis on a personal level. He was one of the first people that I met when I first moved to DC. You know, I moved to DC not knowing anyone. And I was just impressed. He has such energy, such enthusiasm, always willing to go above and beyond to help his community. And so when I was looking for someone who could lead such a distinguished panel, I couldn't think of anybody better than Elvis. So let me share a little bit about Mr. Cordova. He was appointed by President uh, Obama to serve in various leadership roles at the US Department of Agriculture. 
He was most recently served as Acting Undersecretary at the U.S. Department of Agriculture, where he helped to strengthen and advance U.S. agricultural interests worth about $150 billion annually. He oversaw food labeling programs, including organic and biotechnology, international trade regulations, and expansion of regional uh, food systems. He also serves as the White Task Force for Puerto Rico, focusing on building private, uh, private partnerships. At USDA, he also focused on the development and implementation of outreach strategies to foster diversity, inclusion, and innovation, as well as um, boosting investments aid aimed at enhancing the delivery of agricultural education programs to underserved population. Uh, he became um, a federal employee as uh, when he entered the Presidential Management Fellow Program, and then um, eventually went to energy, uh, where he worked on alternative energy, economic development, financial services, and congressional public affairs. Uh, you know, outside of federal government, um, he's been the vice president of public relations at Tolkien Media, director of Public American Programs at Self Reliance Foundation, and a consultant for United Nations. Um, so he's he's kind of a big deal. I'm excited that he's here. Um, I do want to say though that uh, we will have a question and answer portion later on, and we know we have a lot of. Um, people uh, logging on online. So we encourage you to send in your questions. So later on, we will open it up and please feel free to email your questions. We'll take about two or three questions. Um, you can email them at hq-ola at mail.nasa.gov. I'm, I'm sure they'll put it up. <laughs> Thank you. Again, hq-ola at mail.nasa.gov. Um, and we will take those questions from our online audience. Uh, that being said, uh, please join me in welcoming our moderator and our panelists for today. Muchas gracias, Maria, and uh, buenos dias to all of you. It's uh, such a pleasure to be here. Um, I'll tell you a story in a minute, but just know that since I was little, I've thought of being at NASA. Uh, and, and so being here, it's surreal. I keep pinching myself to just make sure I'm not dreaming. Um, but I, I really want to thank Maria and the Ola team for putting together such an amazing event. Uh, I know the work that you put into it, the thought that you put into it. And, and so I just really want to thank you and, and just give you a moment to shine because you and your team have, have really thought this out really well, and I think what can come out of this is going to be important. So if we could just please give them a round of applause for all their amazing work. And on a personal note, thank you for helping a personal dream come true and bringing me here. Um, so one of the things we want to do here today is we want to start a conversation. And we want this conversation to later lead to action. So what we do here today is going to be important because it will instill the thoughts that can take action later. Um, and so we definitely want all of you to participate, not only today, but beyond today, uh, and really help continue this movement. Uh, we hope that we'll be able to provide you with enough seeds for you all to grow some amazing endeavors later on. Uh, and, and what I want to do is I want to take a moment to recognize our panel and, and have them do small, intro, uh, quick intros about the work that they're doing, uh, because they're just absolutely stellar. Uh, no pun intended, uh, and they're doing some amazing things. Uh, and I'd like to start off with Dr. Marla Perez Davis, who's the Deputy Center Director for the NASA Glenn Research Center. Uh, Dr. Perez Davis, if you could give us a quick synopsis of your work. Good morning, buenos dias. Thank you very much for the opportunity to be here. I look forward to the panel discussion and uh, the questions later on. So I serve as Center Deputy Director at NASA Glenn Research Center, and in there I share responsibility with the uh, Center Director for planning, uh, organizing, and managing all the programs and projects that are uh, agency level assigned to the Center. So again, thank you very much for the opportunity to be here. Thank you, Dr. Perez Davis. Uh, second, we have Sandra Alba Kaufman, who is the Deputy Director for the Earth Science Division at the uh, Science Mission Dictorate at here. Directorate. Directorate. Pardon me. <coughs> my action came out. <laughs> it's okay. My at God. NASA that headquarters. <laughs> Please tell us a little bit about your work here at NASA. Yeah. Thank you so much. Hola, como están? Uh, it is uh, uh, nice to be here celebrating um, Hispanic History Month with all of you. 
Uh, so I am the Deputy uh, Director for the Earth Science Division at NASA headquarters, and uh, we oversee um, all of the earth science uh, aspects uh, uh, of the entire agency uh, for earth science. Um, so when I first uh, took this position, I was telling my neighbor that I uh, was going to be working on earth science, and the first thing they asked me was, you're not going to launch satellites anymore. And of course we have satellites, as you all know, you know, and uh, earth science uh, is um, an amazing program, and uh, we mm -hmm. are constantly uh, looking at Earth, uh, looking at our home planet and, and what we do, and I share responsibility with the director in uh, overseeing um, the, the entire portfolio of Earth Science missions, and not only the flight and the technology and the research, but also all the, the societal benefits that entail uh, in, in, in finding out, you know, how this little planet that, that we live in uh, functions and works, so thank you. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. uh, next, we have Dr. Yariska Colado Vega, who is, did I say it right? No. Yariska. <laughs> <laughs> Man, this accent of mine. <laughs> was a physical science at the NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. Dr. Uh, good morning. Hola a todos. Um, yes, my name is Yairesca Collado Vega. Collado. Um, but nobody at Goddard knows me like that. They know me as Yari, because it's a lot easier. Actually, they call me Yari which I'm okay with that. Um, I've been at Goddard for 14 years. I'm originally from uh, Puerto Rico, Marilo Island, which is suffering a little bit now. Um, and I do, I'm actually the lead for the Space Weather team there. I work with the Community Coordinating Modeling Center. We do validation of models for space weather, and we do space weather forecasting to protect NASA robotic missions. And I love, I love my job. Wonderful, thank you very much. Next, we have Marile Colón Robles, who's the Education Outreach Coordinator for the NASA Langley Research Center. Marile, please tell us a little yes. bit about your work. Thank you so much. Um, my name is Marile, and I'm also from Puerto Rico. So thank you so much for your prayers and help for our island. Yes. It really means a lot. Uh, I'm an education specialist, so I get to engage and inspire teachers and students all around the country, and particularly with the GLOBE program, the Global Learning and Observations to Benefit the Environment. What it is, is an international program where anybody can enter their data if they follow the instructions that we have there, and then you get to include your observations so that researchers can do um, their observations of the planet Earth. At NASA Langley, which we're celebrating 100 years right now, uh, we send you um, what a satellite observe if you send us your cloud observations. So you get an email from NASA with your observations next to a satellite that was right on top of you at the same time as you did your observations. So it's really um, powerful and I get to pay it forward, which is always my passion. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Marile. Next, we have Dr. Carolina Aguirre, who is the Director for STEM Education at the University of New Mexico. Hello, and thank you for having me here. I'm very excited. Um, like you, NASA is a big thing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm excited. Um, I am from uh, Albuquerque, New Mexico. I work at the University of New Mexico Valencia branch. So it's a community college. And at that college, I direct a STEM grant, which is um, reaching rural STEM students. So for a living, I've been writing grants and providing uh, funding and direction for students to align them into the STEM fields. Wonderful, thank you very much. Thank you. And that, last but not least, is it's a very impressive individual who's a close friend of mine and, and a mentor of mine, Jose Antonio Tierino. He's the president and CEO of the Hispanic Heritage Foundation. We all like to call him Tony. So Tony, please tell us a little bit about the great work that you do. We focus on education, workforce development, public awareness, and all through, kind of the, across all of those things is connectivity, uh, leadership, and innovation. Um, but we also want to work backwards from what America's priorities are, which end up being, for the most part, in the STEM fields. Wonderful. So, as you can see, we have an amazing diversity of folks, uh, not only in nationalities, but also in their thoughts. Um, and so I promised you a personal story. 
um, back when I first arrived into this country, uh, I grew up in El Salvador, like Maria. Um, and it was funny because I used to watch, I remember watching cartoons that were from Japan. There were these early magna cartoons about being in outer space and, and exploring. And when we migrated to the US due to the Civil War, I remember that one of the first things that greeted me and that made me feel comfortable were these cartoons, right? So these, but they were now in English. And believe it or not, it was these cartoons that actually helped me learn English because I remembered what they were saying in Spanish and slowly things started to translate for me, right? So the international aspect to this, a cartoon in Japan being shown in Latin America greeting me in the United States. Um, talks about the power of communication. Um, and so later on, when I was about to go to high school, I wrote a letter to NASA. I said, hey, I want to be an astronaut, and I'm going to go to high school. Can you please tell me what courses I should take so I can prepare? And at the time, I got this form back, um, just a general form, and had checked off that said, NASA normally picks its astronauts from the scientific and military community, so we have no specific curriculum for you to follow. And I was like, what's a curriculum? <laughs> I need to follow a curriculum. I need to go find a curriculum. Um, I tell that story because, because it, there wasn't a clear path for me to take. That dream got deferred. Uh, my passion and interest in science and astronomy always remained, but I, I wasn't able to materialize it. And so I wanted to really use that example as saying that for young kids, it's, it's really important for them to, to have that chispa, mm -hmm. right? And, and for that to be nurtured uh, and, and for really a path forward to be developed uh, so that they can follow it. Um, and particularly, I think, for Latinos, this is relevant. Um, Latinos who immigrate to the United States, and for that case, all immigrants who immigrate to the United States are used to long journeys, are used to going into the unknown. And, and to some extent, they're, they're almost children of two worlds, mm -hmm. right? Uh, in terms of the old country and, and the new country and adapting to that, but also the generations, right? Because the immigrants who come here and then have children here, their children are staying here. And so this generation of Latinos, what we tend to call the first generation of Latinos, is here to stay in the U.S. and we want to contribute and we love the U.S. This is such, this is our homeland, right? But our parents, right, we, our language, our customs still harken back to this old world, right? So as Latinos, it's almost like we have in our cultural DNA, you know, what it would take to partake in space exploration. Uh, and the STEM fields become very important because they begin to draw that out. But cooperation is, is really what leads to this, right? And it's, it's cooperation and it's how can we all be working together to fit in these different pieces? When we think about the greatest accomplishments in the United States, among them is the space race. Right? And that's when we had a sense of destiny. That's when we had a sense of we're going to accomplish this. We set a clear path, a clear goal for ourselves, and we put all our resources into it. Right? It was the cooperation of many different fields. It was the cooperation of many different peoples that brought that about. And so we now have the opportunity to go to Mars. It's within our grasp and really being able to take the space race to the next level. Um, it's, it's to some extent harkens back to what humanity's challenge is, right? From leaving the cradle of civilization and expanding throughout the globe and now looking at space. And it's ironic because space is, is emptiness, right? But within that emptiness is really where we can find our destiny as a human race. Uh, but that's going to take all of us working together. And I think the space programs in science demands that, right? As you look at where we've been heading now, we have an international space station, right? We knew that one country couldn't do it alone, so how can countries work together, right, to get this accomplishment done? And so in that spirit, we have a lot of work to do. And so as Latinos now, as we are part of this larger collective, how do we contribute to this larger what's because to me space is the ultimate relay race right it's going to be multi-generational and it's going to take all of us really working together putting our resources together and so our panel um, today can discuss about how we can really provide such a path forward for young students high school students and those going into college degrees 
and, and how can we be really accomplishing this? So with that being said, I, I wanted to really have this conversation uh, between all of us and start exploring those paths because there's a lot of work to do. So maybe I can just kind of throw this out at least to, to the group, but let's start with why is STEM education important? Uh, and why particularly should we be engaging the Latino community? Uh, some would say that we need to engage everybody, yes, but if we could focus on why it is important for Latinos um, to really be able to stem up uh, and, and fulfill their, and, and I open it to whoever would like to take that one first. So, so I, I start, and you know, feel free to jump here and add to it. Um, so, so you talk about you know, space exploration, at, you know, that's one of the drivers. There's also aeronautics. Mm -hmm. So um, is technical leadership, how we can sustain the technical leadership in this country. Mm -hmm. So when you look at how many Hispanic, the Hispanic population in the you know, United States, you have 17, 18% that are Hispanic. So that's untapped potential. We have to find a way to tap that potential because only 10% get to STEM. So that's a very small amount. Mm -hmm. So first of all, we have to retain that 10% because 10% is what get out of the you know, high um, education institutions. Some of them stay in the STEM field, some of them do not stay in the STEM field. So we do have a responsibility to tap that potential. You know, the storytelling, I think you know, we mm -hmm. heard some stories this morning. I came from you know, Puerto Rico, mm -hmm. so I have my story too. But we have to use the power of the storytelling to really motivate and inspire that generation. That is possible, that can be done. Take words, but again, you, you mentioned that. They're, they're used to challenges. It's not like they don't know the challenge, but we have to provide the opportunities to really untap that potential. Um, I also wanna say, like, like she said, like the storytelling is very important. As a scientist, when I do a presentation, I wanna say what is my sciences and explain it, but I also wanna say who I am so people can connect with me in a different level. And that also started when I, I always did educational outreach because I really love it. And one of the things that I always say is I, where I'm from. And I usually say something in Spanish, you know, to get the conversation going. And one time in one of the presentations, I, uh, this small, small kid came to meet a female and she said, wow, I didn't know I could become a scientist. And that for me actually hit my heart because she was telling me that I made an imprint on her. You know, I made that change on her mind. And it has to do also by the culture that they come up. You know, I had a very uh, supportive family, which I'm very blessed for, but I did have people around me saying, you're not gonna get to NASA, you're not gonna work for NASA, you're not gonna be a scientist. Look at you, because they have these stereotypes in their minds and they let that clear the path when you know you don't have to change who you are to actually do what you love. So that's part of the whole idea. Get the story going so the kids actually understand where you come from, how you became what you are, and they can also do it. I have to say that um, um, kids is gonna be what they cannot see too. And uh, so we have to uh, be uh, role models. Um, and you know, female, Hispanic, of course, uh, you know, I, I like to uh, show the girls that, that it can be done. And uh, I always, um, you know, it, Hispanics are the, the fastest growing uh, community in the United States. And like Marla was saying, you know, it's an untapped potential. It's a lot of girls who uh, say, well, I'm female, I'm Hispanic, and uh, maybe I cannot aspire to be, you know, a scientist or an engineer. Mm -hmm. And I have made it my, my life mission to really em encourage and empower all of these uh, uh, girls in particular in, in Hispanic communities that they really can be whoever they want to be if they put forth the effort. It's not easy. I, uh, you know, I come from Costa Rica. I also immigrated to uh, uh, the United States, and uh, it wasn't easy. It took me seven years to uh, pass through college. It was very hard, but you know, I did it. And um, and, and and by sharing the story, telling, sharing the stories, and and how I was able to to accomplish the dreams that I had, uh, you know, it is a it is a, a, a way for for these girls. And I have had so many girls come and said, you know, I didn't know that I could. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, 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 and I'm already trying, and I'm gonna stick the path, and I'm gonna continue uh, putting forth the effort. Uh, you know, so it's always very uh, rewarding when, when you hear uh, those kind of messages back, that, that whatever little seeds you're planting out there 
are, are, are taking root and, and they are gonna grow. And we have to start with the elementary school. I think that's where you plant those seeds. Um, I got it um, uh, inspired to, uh, by, you know, to work on the space program when I was seven years old. And I mean, seven years old, five years old, I don't know. We, we know what we want at that age. Uh, so we have to plant those seeds then and then slowly nurture them so they can grow and develop into their beautiful blooming flowers and everything. <laughs> yeah. You know, why do we answer that question? Please, yes. Because yeah, I look at it as a two um, big areas. One is that as a community, we've been recently devalued and defined by others. In order to define ourselves and present that value proposition to America that we as Latinos or as immigrants or as women offer, we have to work backwards from what America needs the most. And right now, there's half a million jobs unfilled in the tech space. I'll just stick to one part of the STEM. Um, areas. There's 1.1 million that'll have to be filled over the next three years. So as much as Latinos traditionally have always answered the call in terms of jobs that need to be done in America, we'll fight your wars, we'll build your bridges, we'll build your homes, we'll take care of your children, we'll pick your food, we'll serve your food. Whatever it takes, we nobly do it. Now the great need for the workforce is in the STEM fields. And once again, we'll be able to fill those areas. And there's nothing America can do. We ne they need us, and we need America. So it is a responsibility that we all have, as my mother told me. You have a greater responsibility than somebody that's born here because we had to fight to get here. Um, you owe America a lot more than America owes you. And I think that we carry that with us in our hearts, um, and it drives us in terms of what those contributions are. But as of right now, um, 10,000 baby boomers reach retirement age every single day over the next decade. 10,000. Who's going to fill that gap? Youngest segment of the population? Fastest growing segment of the population? Seven out of 10 new jobs in America will be filled by Latinos. New jobs. So it's two, two out of three. We want to make sure that those jobs are in the STEM fields. Again, to work backwards from what America needs. And we're always up to the task, and we have to make sure that our kids are getting that chispa of inspiration mm -hmm. from an early, early stage. We were just talking about how my kids, we put in front of them, whether it was, I think it was like Angry Birds or something, that actually was coding, even though they thought they were playing video games. It wasn't. It was a form of coding. And at our organization, we always try to look at things where Latinos over-index in terms of playing video games that we do programs where we engage kids by saying, you like to play video games? How about developing one? And that leads into cyber um, opportunities and in coding and all these other things. So um, I think those are critical pieces to me, is that we need to define ourselves and define that value that we offer America. And the way to do that is to work backwards from what America needs most, which are the STEM jobs. And, and you bring an interesting point, Tony, because Latinos are the fastest growing in terms of, you know, uh, early childhood education in, in pre-high school, you know, this 25% of the population is made up of Latinos and Latino graduation rates are actually uh, increasing, which is great to see. Uh, but there's, there's a gap in the STEM fields. Uh, and, and so I wanted to en engage our remaining panelists. Why do you think um, this gap exists? And, and of course, it's open to all, but I wanted to give uh, Dr. Carolina and Marilea a chance to talk. Well, I actually was going to add to your point, um, and also to answer this question is, the other thing that we see here in the United States is that we are a knowledge economy. Mm -hmm. We are counting on that knowledge economy to make us the innovators, to continue to push us forward, uh, to come up with the next best thing. And it always, well, it is seemingly always in an area of STEM that all the great innovations are coming from. If most of our Hispanic population is not able to participate in that knowledge economy, because they are finishing high school now um, at a better rate, which is good. However, they're still not participating in the economy in the way that the world needs us to. And it's not just the United States, but we're innovators, we're thinkers, we create solutions, we're problem solvers. And if we aren't educating or if that gap continues, um, Latinos will continue to do well. 
but they also need their place in the knowledge economy. They need to have the opportunity to innovate. Mm -hmm. and, it, and it was brought up, the need for um, a term that an educator um, used in the 90s of windows and mirrors. Mirrors so that they can see someone that looks like them, mm -hmm. speaks like them, went through similar situations so that they can relate. So when we go and say, you can have a STEM opportunity, you can work at NASA, they see it as an actual possibility, right? The other one are windows. We need to show them the opportunities that exist. And through that, we really need to work with the teachers of these students. We need to work with the communities and the families. So really involving everybody together and the beauty of STEM is that STEM is in everything, right? We have basically supercomputers in our hands, right? Our phones, right? That is STEM. They're already doing STEM. So it's really supporting those teachers, the community, the parents to say, this is already STEM and you're doing it and you can go forward with it. Mm -hmm. I think that's very important and necessary. It's wonderful. Yay, if I may call you that. Um, <laughs> how, important, how important is STEM curriculum um, in early learning um, for Hispanic communities? And how do you think we can be doing a better job of preparing our students um, for the STEM fields? So like as Sandra said, um, when you get the kids when they're really early, that's when you plant the seed. And it's very interesting because when you give presentations to different levels of kids, you see how they change their minds. At the beginning, they're always like excited. Wow, I love that science. And they get really excited about everything that you talk about. Then in middle school, they start asking more about how that happens, you know, everything like that. And then in high school, then they derail a little bit. Because now they're interested in how much money you make. That's reality. That's the questions that I get. How much money do you make? And I said, well, I mean, I wanted to be tourism when I was in high school because I, I always wanted to be a scientist when I was a kid. But then I got the real of myself. And in high school, I thought about do, doing tourism. But then one, one teacher said, no, you're good at science, go to science. So I started my uh, undergrad in physics. So I decided to be poor. No, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. Just kidding. Uh, but you know, everybody that does science knows that it's not a field to be rich. It's, you do it because you love it, right? And when I gave that presentation to the high school where they started saying, you know, how much do you make? I said, oh my God, yeah, we need to plant the seed on the smallest ones, but we also need to keep them in the path while they go through the whole school time, right? Yes. Because at the high school level, I wish I had a scientist go to my school and say what they did and how they worked on and say that they worked for NASA because that would have actually given me a little bit more of push of keep doing it what I did. Right? Yes. So I think it's really important to actually, for us, to be mentors all the time. And like she said, she said, it's not only to the kids, it's also to the teachers. We also have to communicate to the teachers so the teachers can give that kind of also impact and communication to this kid, the kids when they work with them every single day. School is the second home. Yes. So that's where they, they learn the most, right? Yes. So. Next time they ask you that, though, you can make a million dollars more in a STEM field than in a non-STEM field. So there, there is an answer yeah, to an that answer question to of how much you can make. I, I was going to say that uh, um, I usually get this from kids. Well, I'm not that good at math. And I always look at them, and it's like, it's not whether you're good or bad at math. It's how much effort you want to put into learning mm -hmm. the subject. I mean, it might take a little more, a little less. But you know, if you want something, exactly, yeah. you can do it. And, and the other thing is uh, they are afraid. You know, we're afraid of failure. And uh, the first time you fail calculus, you know, you're just like, I'm not good at this. Well, what do you do? You take it again until you learn it. I took a class three times. And uh, I know I needed it for engineering, and I wasn't going to be an engineer if I wasn't going to, if I didn't take electromagnetic theory. And uh, by the third time I took it, I learned it. Thank God, you know. But, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, it, but, it, but it is uh, the, the <clears throat> biggest issue that we have is retaining the kids in mm -hmm. those careers. You know, once they fail or they find that they're not doing so well in a class that is required, then they drop out and then go into some other field that is a lot easier. So we have to encourage them to, to stick the path. And it's hard. It's not easy. But they can do it if they put forth the effort. And I know mm -hmm. uh, you know, some of us had to go through a lot of things to, 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 to do it. But it is, it is, it is possible.
possible, so. And, and that actually happened to me too. I was in an undergrad and I was taking physics for the first time, uh, graduate, uh, you know, undergrad physics. And I took the first exam and I said, no, this is not for me. I'm gonna do electrical engineer because that's what I like. I like electricity, uh, everything that is abstract. <laughs> And when that time I actually had to, when I wanted to withdraw from the whole uh, major, you had, the professor had to sign it, the one that it was the, the chair of the faculty. And he was the same professor that was giving me the physics course. Okay. And he said, no, you're not going. <laughs> and I said, well, I need you to sign this. And he's like, no, I'm not gonna sign. <laughs> and I said, I have a C in your class. He's like, yeah, from the first exam. Take it easy, because you know, the first exam is always the, the, the hardest. You're gonna be a great physicist one day. And that was a turn on point for me because uh -huh. if he hadn't done that, who knows where you know I would end up. And right now, I work for NASA and I'm a scientist doing yes. space weather. So, and so you said something really important, which was the mentors. Um, and and again, with our theme of you know how do we find a path forward, I know that Marla and Sandra, you two have had incredible careers, very distinguished careers, and, and really moving high up the ranks in government. Um, could you talk a little bit about your personal journeys? Uh, and, and what advice you would have for others who want to emulate that, who want to follow in your footsteps, or, or develop a, kind of a path for themselves as they move forward with their careers? So um, the first thing, mentors. Let's start with, uh, with mentors. I think mentors are very important in every journey. It doesn't matter personal or professional, but let's stick with the, uh, with the STEM. When I was growing up in, in Puerto Rico, um, I didn't have um, mentors or role models, individuals that were engineers. But as many of them have taught, I write chemistry and math. And one good day, and this is a true story, um, I pull out a book and I look at the definition of an engineer. And at that point in time, there was not as many type of engineers that we have now. So there was just the basic, you know, electrical, you know, chemical, uh, civil engineer. So I look at those and I said, Oh, I like chemistry and I like math. So I'm gonna be a chemical engineer. So I went to my <laughs> chemistry teacher, very excited about I, I know <laughs> what I'm gonna be. I'm gonna be a chemical engineer. And my teacher said, why do you wanna be that? Well, you cannot be an engineer. So um, my heart was broken, but I just, like many of us, you know, it's just, okay, listen, but not listen. So no, I'm <laughs> determined to be a an, uh, chemical engineer. So. Um, I went to um, the only engineer school at that point in uh, Puerto Rico, which is, uh, was the University of Puerto Rico, Maya Wesner, number of engineer schools these days. But at that point in time, there was only one. And um, I started chemical engineering. So looking back, I could be very wrong because again, I didn't have the benefit of having role models or uh, other engineers around. Uh, I had been uh, very uh, fortunate to have the career that I have and I get there now to my responsibility. So I truly believe on mentors. I have mentors all my career since I started in NASA. And some of them have stick through the journey. Some of them has been, you know, for a period of time. But I think the value of mentorship is incredible. Uh, the other thing is once you start getting in your career, you also have the responsibility now to mm -hmm. pay back. You gotta be a mentor. You have to be a mentor. I think that's the way that we untap some of that um, knowledge that is out there. That's the way that we inspire and motivate people. It is not just for um, students, it's also in the workplace. I think the value of mentorship is incredible. I can tell you that every time I mentor someone, I learn as much as hopefully they learn from me because it is a two-way street. It's not just one-way street. The value of mentorship is incredible. So I really ask everyone in this room and the ones that I listen, please find time to mentor. Find the time to mentor someone at you know, um, school level, um, universities, at the workplace. And for, you know, it's, it's one of those things that you never know what you're gonna get out of it. Sometimes it doesn't work, so let's be clear. Um, there's something about the chemistry between the individuals, but that also is a learning by itself. So um, that would be you know, my advice to individuals. Find someone that is in your career path, someone that is not. Because sometimes we get very narrow in terms of we understand our world and we forgot that there's other worlds out there. So find someone also that is not in your field because that's the way to make sure that you connect 
and you also express the value of what you do in STEM and how all these fields are related. I think you know it was mentioned, everything is STEM is are everywhere. So the value of technology is in every single step that we mm -hmm. take these days. And um, so, that, so that would be my, my advice. Sandra, please. So I didn't have uh, mentors when I was little. I only had a, a bold dream and a mother who was very encouraging. Mm -hmm. And uh, my mother didn't finish high school, but uh, to her, the, you know, she knew that the ticket to uh, um, be, you know, have a, have a life and everything was uh, to education, to do education and, and to really uh, be whoever you wanted to be. And uh, when I told her I wanted to go to the moon, and she says, sure, you know, put your mind to it. And uh, she never told me I couldn't. You know? So I tried to go to the moon. I never went to the moon, of course. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, you know, the, the, the only time when I first had a, a, somebody who could be a mentor or potential mentor was a, 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 a high school uh, math teacher. And uh, she, um, I had a conversation with her. And uh, you know, I liked math. And, uh, I, it wasn't that I was good at it, I just worked hard. And uh, she said, you know, you ought to look at studying um, engineering. And she says, I tried and I couldn't because, um, you know, I'm a woman and whatever, but maybe nowadays you can. Well, when I graduated and went to college, I sort of happened what Marla happened. They told me I couldn't be an engineer because I was a woman. Um, so, you know, I spent, um, uh, they let me study industrial engineering, which it was still engineering, but in, and they said it was the ladylike engineering because there were four girls in the pro. <laughs> Um, wow. But I still wanted to study electrical, and uh, you know, after doing a little research as to the various disciplines and everything, I was bound and determined that I wanted to be an electrical engineer. So I tried to transfer it a couple of times, and they still turned me down. So my heart was broken, like Marla's, <laughs> and um, that's when I decided to come to the states. And uh, and you know, I threw away basically seven semesters of education I had had in Costa Rica, and um, I changed majors, and I finally graduated with a double major: electrical engineering and physics. And, um, and, you know, it took me seven years to start the path, you know. But, you know, I've always tried to find mentors. I've always tried to seek out the help of, of others. Uh, you have to speak up if you need help. You cannot, you know, people don't know that you need help. If you, don't, if you need help, go and, and ask for the help. You know, people don't read minds. And, uh, and also, you know, mentors are not there waiting for mentees to come to them. You know, go and ask people. And, and, and I've always tried to have more than one mentor, and the best mentors that I have ever had are the mentors that are listening to me, that are uh, really trying to um, uh, extract the, 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 my thoughts and not tell me what to do, but they uh, help me figure out on my own how I'm going to do things uh, my own way. And um, you know, so and, and and I also like to mentor people now that that I have. Uh, that I mean, you know, I've grown up, I guess, in my career, and um, you know, I have so many years here, and uh, you know, the up-and-coming generation, and uh, and I try to kind of do the same thing that my older mentors did, you know, listen to them and try to ask them questions so they can figure it out their own path, you know, because it's not what I tell them to do that is going to uh, make or break them; it's what they figured out how they can, they're going to proceed on, on their own. Uh, but mentorship, men mentoring is, is so important, and, and asking for help. If you don't know something, go and ask for help. I mean, there is more than, you know, there are a lot of angels out there who are willing to help you succeed and uh, help you with whatever, you know, things that you need. So uh, don't, don't stop asking questions and don't stop seeking mentors. And I know, Tony, you wanted to chime in on that. And what I wanted to do was also present an additional question for you and Marile uh, in terms of, the work that you all that you do at Hispanic Heritage Foundation deals a lot with these competitions, right? Coding competition and STEM. So I wanted you to also comment on, um, you know, how important are these, and, and how are they engaging that next generation and in inspiring them and opening doors for them? So the first thing is going back to the role model thing. It, it's really important that we also promote young role models. There's a mm -hmm. young woman named Sofia Sanchez Mayes, who is now actually at JPL even though she's a junior in college. And she's working there. She was coded for the Mars rover at 16 years old. Um, she developed, I think, the most efficient way of turning algae into a biofuel that's ever been done when she was like 14 years old out of Las Cruces, New Mexico. So Sofia, to me, is more important than anyone to be a role model because she's currently still a teenager. Um, and having a huge impact um, mm -hmm. through our organization when we uh, awarded her with the Youth Award, part of it was sending out a public awareness campaign based on her accomplishments and on her 
um, uh, sh radiating that possibilities that everyone sh can have through a natural curiosity. So I remember setting up a, a, a panel and I had Ellen Ochoa on the panel and I had Sophia. And at that time, I think she was 17, and Ellen Ochoa, of course, as accomplished as you can get. And it was interesting as she walked up and said, you know, you're my role model, and I said, you know, it's even more important that you're somebody's role model right now um, because of everything that she's accomplished. We work that into our programs. So for instance, uh, Aleida Olvera, who's a sophomore, just started her sophomore year at, at Georgetown in computer science, and is also focusing on cyber um, security, uh, this young lady is from Rio Grande Valley, received our, our fellowship for the video gaming, then received our youth award, brought her up to Washington, D.C., and she wants to do policy, kind of STEM policy and computer science policy. Well, she's teaching our Code as a Second Language program in the D.C. area at, seven, at 18 years old. Um, and she's the one that's going from the different schools and, and introducing kids to coding. So it's really important that programmatically um, that you're out there pushing um, the STEM fields as a viable option for youth. And a lot of times it's really important that you have somebody that's near their age. As mm -hmm. much as you appreciate a male 70 year old ex-engineer teaching a 15 year old girl, I think it's more important to have a 19, 20, 21 year old young woman teaching um, the girls about STEM. And that's the importance of all of you too, being Latina, uh, to have that resonate. The other thing that we're doing, and I have to give credit to uh, Jasmine right there, um, Samorano, who our, oversees our programs, I mean, she just developed this program where we <coughs> go into 15 different communities and the kids actually can hack a career in STEM and work with experts like some of you to act and with a curriculum to actually work through what their career look like. So all of you are now going to be hit on to be part <laughs> of this program. And young people actually work through what that career would look like. And it really lays out a path, but they then get to go back and do research and see what those careers would be like. And I'm hearing that a lot in terms of the exposure that you had. Luckily, you were cabeza duros and just went ahead <laughs> after somebody was trying to discourage you. But we want to make sure to encourage, and all of you play such a significant role in doing that. <clears throat> And this is a great segue because the, these competitions give students and the teachers an opportunity of what it looks in real life. You can't really aspire to be a scientist if you don't see what it is like. You can't aspire to be an engineer, especially when you're in high school, if you don't see what it's like. So these competitions, more than just competing, is really helping each other, learning that it's an actual team competition. We didn't land rovers on Mars by one just individual. It was teams, it was different centers. So it really brings that opportunity uh, to the forefront and also um, makes them more secure that they can actually do it and see other people, role models, they can become role models themselves, right? One of my teachers calls it a coopetition. You're cooperating <laughs> with the other teams, but it's still a competition. So um, as we know that we learn different ways, these STEM competitions are not so much about competitions, but about bringing what it is like and really focusing on how we need to support each other and lift everybody up. You know, time really does fly when you're having fun, and I know that we're reaching the end of this particular segment before we uh, have some questions from the audience and, and those watching on the live stream, but I wanted to give uh, that last question to Yadi and Carolina, and I know that Yadi, you were the co-host for the uh, solar eclipse uh, television, television program that NASA put together. And I wanted to focus in on the communication piece mm -hmm. uh, and also Carolina, right? How can we be using these different methods of communication to be doing better outreach to inspiring folks and to just think of new ways of really being able to engage a young public and a public that maybe had not thought about science and saying, whoa, I can be part of this. If you could talk a little bit about that, please. I would efforts. actually like to piggyback on what you said earlier as far as being present and uh, being just uh, a person that it's very approachable that students can talk to mm -hmm. and so forth. Um, I find that with a lot of the university students, when they come across a class that they are now struggling with, oh, I guess science wasn't yeah. meant for me. <clears throat> They don't hear enough 
how many times as an accomplished scientist had to uh, take a class over, you know, how many um, parties they may have missed, how much um, <laughs> work they didn't get to do. And the real issue is many of the students that I work with, it, it's again, it's, um, it's a trade-off. If I am putting this much time and energy into my school, how do I have time and energy for this part-time job? that I absolutely need because I don't have gas in my car. Mm -hmm. I cannot get to school without gas in my car. Mm -hmm. So I see that students are, are um, trying to balance these items. And so I, um, I think that the communication to them is extremely important. And um, the trust, it's not only to the students, but to their parents. They have to trust. <coughs> that this is all going to be worth it. And I think that a lot of what you do and being very present for the students is extremely important. Yeah, thank you. Um, and, and it's a different environment, right? High school is very different than you go to college. And I mean, it's like the trade-off of the work that you have to do is super different. And some kids just get shocked by that. And they have to understand that you have to work hard if what to do what you really love to do. Um, talking about the clips, one of the things that was um, that I did very innocently, but I really wanted people to know that I was from Puerto Rico. I actually wore a T-shirt that was from my university, and it had the logo of the University of Puerto Rico, Mayagüez. Um, and the thing is that I innocently, right, I, I thought, oh yeah, the university's gonna find out in a couple days that I wore the shirt. Um, while I was there doing the TV show, my phone didn't stop vibrating. And it was all people from Mayagüez sending texts to friends that friends that knew me, and then my friends were texting me, and like my Facebook account was, you know, bombarded with posts, and it was amazing. And I, I thought, wow, I, I knew that it was going to be an impact, but I didn't expect it to be that big. And it's because I took the opportunity that I had, being in a TV show, right? to say, I am here, you can also be here. Um, but like I said, it, it was an amazing and unexpected reaction. Oh, wonderful. Well, um, we definitely want to give the audience, uh, both here and watching uh, on live stream, to be able to participate in this conversation. So uh, there's a mic going around. If there are any questions, if you could please raise your hand, and uh, we'll make sure that the mic goes to you. Uh, and if there, I see one in the back. Hi. Thank you again for the panel. It was very, very interesting. Um, I want to follow up on uh, a couple of things that you've all mentioned, um, and specifically Tony uh, making the point of the million dollar job on STEMs. Um, I think it's important, and I want your opinion, to give kids choices. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it was very interesting how Elvis asked NASA, what do I need to do? And you got an answer saying, well, you need to follow a curriculum. And you had no idea what a curriculum was. Um, and I know NASA has a website of careers. Um, what is your opinion on when you're doing these presentations to kids to provide them with a wide array of options that range from just doing like a two-year tech all the way through PhDs? Because um, in each of those steps, you have um, you can tap into uh, different uh, workforces. Mm -hmm. And so maybe a PhD is not for everybody, and maybe a two-year degree is not for everybody, but when they uh, have their eye on NASA, what is the range that they can they can um, access to get a job? Um, because the question that you get in high school, how much money am I going to make? It's a very real question. Mm -hmm. Kids are going to yeah. have to pay for college if they want to go to college. Is it worth it? Um, I am a scientist. I'm a PhD, and I find it sometimes hard to encourage, especially mm -hmm. young women. Um, to pursue a PhD, and I, I'm compelled to tell them how, what are the challenges they're going to find? And I think if a person is very, is really truly inspired, and that is what they want to do, they will follow their dream. Um, but it is, I find it that it, we need to be honest with them and let them know, look, these are the challenges that you're going to that you're going to find. Mm -hmm. You're not going to be rich. You're not going to be poor. But this is your spectrum. So I want to hear your opinion on what are the dangers or what are the pros and cons between. Um, of, of starting to give kids this information? Um, 
like you said, there's pro, uh, pros and cons, right, to telling the information about its challenges. Like when you say a kid say, I want to be a scientist, then you have to tell them that you need a PhD to be a scientist. And probably you'll be at school longer than if you want to be an engineer. But you also have to give them that diverse you know, curriculum. Like you, you want to be scientist, then yes, you can do this. But also in engineering, you can also do some kind of scientist. You do a lot of math. Like you give them that kind of like introduction to the reality of things, right? And engineers work with scientists all the time and vice versa. That's how NASA is built. Um, and not only that, people also think that NASA is composed by only scientists and engineers. That's wrong. There's a lot of business administration people here, and a lot of people don't know that. And that's also another opportunity for them to come to work with NASA. Without people controlling and having that kind of uh, ability to do the management of the projects, scientists and engineers won't be able to put things out there, right? We need everybody working together. Uh, I also tell them my story. Like it wasn't, I left my island to come here to do my PhD, and I had a master's, physics master's from University of Puerto Rico. Uh, but I wanted to be a scientist, so I had to have my PhD. So I had to leave my island. Not only that, I had to go back and forth because I was in a program. And every time I did that, I had to rent furniture, you know, move around all the time. So it wasn't an easy journey. So I think. Like I said, you know, being personal, tell them your own journey so they know it's not going to be easy, and also give them that diverse curriculum. Like you can be all of this to work for NASA. I think it helps. Can Can I answer that too? Uh, and uh, I have to go back to my own kids because I mean, you want to give this, you want to treat these kids and give them the same advice that you will give your own your own kids. I have two boys, and uh, my oldest son is on his third year on his PhD, and. Uh, he has an undergraduate in psychology, and uh, when he said that he was going to be a psychologist, uh, you know, we just kind of, my husband is a physicist and I'm an engineer, you know, and, uh, but you know, he, he decided he wanted to, he doesn't want to be a doctor, then, uh, you know, we tried to give him the best honest advice that we could, you know, it wasn't going to be easy. If he really wanted to do something with psychology, he had to go for an advanced degree, and this is, you know, what you do, and he did his research, and he chose to, uh, get a PhD in cognitive systems, which is sort of like the marriage between computers and the brain, and don't ask me what he's doing now, but. <laughs> uh, and my youngest is different, you know, the kids are all different, and uh, you know, so you, it, sometimes you wanna give them the best advice and the best honest advice, but again, you know, going back to the mentoring, you know, help them form their own opinions mm -hmm. and how mm -hmm. it's gonna work for them, because I mean, I know my kids and I know what kind of advice I can give them because I know them, but I don't know all of these kids, and you have to extract all that from them mm -hmm. so they can form their own ideas as to what is it that they, how hard they wanna work. Do they really have what, what it takes to get a PhD or not? Does it really, you know, do they really have, you know, want to be mm -hmm. a, a, an engineer or, or a scientist or a mathematician. Some of them are really good musicians, and that's all they want to do. And it doesn't matter, you know, what you tell them; they are not going to go in all these careers, you know. But you want them to really pursue their passion and do something with their lives and, and be productive members of society. So uh, that's. Uh, so I, I would like to add um, something um, a little bit different. I think you know, in options, there's also the, the power of collaborations. Because we at NASA, we have a lot of areas that we influence in terms of technology. But sometimes it's difficult for us to translate that to students. So I think that's the mm -hmm. power of relationship, you know, with universities, with uh, K to 12, uh, with organizations, nonprofit organizations that really get the message out. We can take the message to some level, but I think we need that uh, bridge to make sure to provide the options in a way that they understand. I think, you know, I resonate with the curriculum, right? We talk about curriculum like something that everybody knows. Well, sometimes that's the first question. Yeah, what is the curriculum, the curriculum, right? Yeah. So I think we need to establish that relationship to do the translation and really be able to reach out to that population. And I think it's really powerful as we talk about role models that rarely is it a, a straight, narrow path. It's always zigzagging. You go to over here, you go over there, and at the end it all makes sense. Like I studied music, then I studied chemistry, then I am in education, but now it all makes sense. Mm -hmm. And rarely is it straight, and I think that is very, um, can depress people thinking that it's a straight path, and that's not the reality. Bring the, life will bring you all the 
uh, opportunities that you'll need for that future you. And I know that we have a question from the, uh, our live stream audience. So Maria, please. Go on. Actually, this is a question for me. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so I just wanted to, uh, we're talking about getting kids encouraged and motivating and um, so on and so forth. But I think it's also very important for them to empower themselves through research. Right? Uh, you find everything online. NASA, we have unlimited resources online. Um, in terms of getting a career, somebody asked, well, how do you get them in the door? First of all, once they, you know, we have to be very involved in the communities and the colleges and universities. We have to be planting those seeds and harvest so that we can then harvest them, right? Um, the way to bring them into the workforce is for them to become as competitive as possible. So uh, just uh, empower yourself through research. Find out what it takes to obtain a job. Uh, learn about our different centers, uh, the different opportunities we have. We have opportunities across the board, from administration to science engineering, um, you know, uh, from A through Z, we have careers. So yes, you can be a scientist, yes, you can be an engineer, but you can also be an accountant, you can be a procurement analyst, you can be so on and so forth, you know what I mean? But I did want to ask a question going into the career path. My question is for, Dr. Um, uh, Marla. So once you have those individuals in the career pipeline, um, you as a, the deputy director of our Glenn Research Center, what do you look for when you're looking for talent, for workforce? Mm -hmm. How do you cultivate those employees? How do you grow your workforce? So um, that's, that's an excellent question. You know, one thing is bring people, right? We talk about that on top potential. We bring the potential here. So now we have a responsibility to make sure that we pro provide that career growth. So a couple of things that we haven't talked about diversity and inclusion. We talk a lot about diversity. That's great. But we also have to take steps toward inclusion. And that's where really you develop the people's skills and knowledge. So there's two, two ways to treat again here. One is the organization has the responsibility to foster diversity and inclusion, an environment that really promote and foster you got to develop yourself. And then there's the individual responsibility. Sometimes, you know, we get the same way like we're going through high school. It's like a cycle. Um, we get discouraged. There's frustration in the workplace. It's not like you get in the workplace and everything is great. There's going to be challenges. So you have to have to learn about those challenges and trying to figure out where's your path within your career. Because not everybody wants to be, you know, a PhD scientist, right? Some people are okay, they, they get their undergraduate, they get outstanding contributions to the NASA mm -hmm. mission. Mm -hmm. uh, there's other individuals that have this need to continue their development. And I really think that that is really very critical, having that um, self-motivation, self-awareness to grow with your career because things change, you have to adapt and you have to um, strive to be better than what you are today. But there's also the organization component. Anyone that has a position also is in a leadership position. As a leader, you have to make sure that you recognize that you also influence the environment and you have to have an environment that is inclusive. You have to have an environment that you reward people for their development. I think that's how we make sure that we continue the career development. So it's both ways, individual and organization. Thank you, and I know that we have an online question. Yes, uh, good morning. So we've had some really good comments on there that <coughs> we're happy to share with you, but one particular question is for the entire panel, but in particular for Dr. Carolina. Uh, what would be your advice for young people who find that they have family pressure to stay near their other family? Because as Latinos and immigrants in general, we culturally experience pressure to stay near our families regardless of local opportunity. Mm -hmm. And this came in from Doris online. Thank you. Um, that's a very real and daily occurrence at the campus that I work at and that at uh, actually at all of the campuses that I've been on is um, it is a big scary world and if you're coming from a family or um, community where uh, 
resources are scarce, and I know that is the case with everyone uh, here uh, speaking and hearing about your stories, but from um, a rural community when your presence is needed nearby to assist the family or to be part of that community while you're going to school, there's a lot of pressure on these students and the thought of leaving the state to go uh, to an internship, even to be gone for a whole summer, that is a very big ordeal for the family because uh, they may not have the funds to um, purchase even clothing and uh, airline tickets so that you can participate in the internship. And so oftentimes students are discouraged in uh, taking advantage of opportunities that would be game changers in their life and in their career. And their families are afraid of losing them. Their families are afraid of what might happen to them out there um, and that they would not be there to support them. So those are very real. And the way that, that um, those can be overcome is one by building confidence with the families. So that means that here's a uh, college student and you know, it's 22 years old and wants to go on an internship, that might mean that I'm talking to uh, the student's parents. That might mean that I'm talking to family and trying to build their confidence and coaching the student on what they can tell their family and how they can uh, come up with making ends meet to be able to take advantage of internships or going on to graduate school. I was a director of a Ronald D. McNair program, and one of the key components with that program was to have the students do undergraduate research and then take their research and present it out of state at a conference. When I traveled with these students, many of them had never been on an airplane. They had never been in an airport that had a moving sidewalk. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> so, but yet they were very well-educated students, were brilliant. So it's those experiences that make a difference. And all I can say to our, um, our caller is, or you just have to build their confidence that it will be okay. And um, the little things that seem like barriers, they're not that much. We can find a way past that barrier because guess what? There'll be another one down the road and now you'll know how to solve that one too. Well, folks, um, unfortunately, the time has come for us to really begin wrapping up this segment of the program. So we wanted to, number one, thank our distinguished panelists for their thoughts. Uh, and, and <laughs> their time and dedication. Um, you all are amazing heroes, and I applaud you for the work that you're doing and continue. Um, and, and for the rest of us here, um, how can we really stem up? Right? What, what can we be doing to help each other out? What can we be doing to inspire each other? And, and what can we be really doing to keep on dreaming? Right? Because dreams do come true. Um, thank so thank you very much for everybody who participated. Uh, and I will turn it now to Barbara, who will take us to the next segment. Hola, I'm Barbara Trujillo. I'm proud to be serving as the OLA Vice Chair here at NASA headquarters. Can I just say, wow, wasn't that a great panel? I just want to thank you for sharing your expertise, your passion. You can feel the passion in answering your questions and talking about your stories. And to support the Latino STEM Up, I know that I'm inspired by your accomplishments. I came from Las Cruces, New Mexico, and I made it to NASA, too. <laughs> Let me just say that. Um, and I think you're making a difference uh, for the future, you know, for our country, for the Earth, uh, for future scientists, technologists, engineers, and mathematicians. So again, please join me in another round of applause for these distinguished panel members and moderator. I also like to acknowledge the support from many others that helped us make this event possible. Um, our OLA champion, who couldn't be with us today, Acting Associate Deputy Administrator, Kristen Paquin. Our OLA sponsor, Jay Hen, the Executive Director for Headquarters Operations. 
Crystal Moten, our Director for Equal Opportunity and Diversity Management Division and her staff, the media teams from headquarters and from Goddard, the Office of Communications, the graphics team, and many other volunteers that stepped up to ha help us. And I'd be remiss if I wouldn't thank Maria Santos, our OLA chair, for her vision and leadership, and for all the other OLA members that were here to support us. So next, I'd like to bring uh, Crystal. She is going to present uh, to the moderator and our panel members a token of our appreciation. Good morning, everyone. Again, my name is Crystal Moten, and I'm the director of the Equal Opportunity and Diversity Management Division here at NASA headquarters. And I'd just like to say um, I was truly inspired today. A fantastic panel, um, fantastic discussion. Um, you all have touched on so many areas that we can all um, glean some knowledge and insight, inspiration to take us forward to engage our young people. So thank you very, very much for your presence. We really appreciate you today. Thank you so much. And so um, I have the um, pleasure of presenting a token of our appreciation. I'm going to read the um, the, um, mon the uh, inscription uh, and uh, we'll be presenting them to you all and I understand I'm going to present and then the panel will step um, from the, um, the, um, the stage. So it reads, for your exceptional contribution and participation in the Hispanic Outreach and Leadership Alliance celebration of Hispanic Heritage Month at NASA headquarters, October 12, 2017. It's signed by our executive director, Mr. J.M. Henn, um, Office of Headquarters Operations, NASA. So, um, and Jay could not be here today. Um, again, um, we appreciate you, and uh, we just wanted to give you a token of our appreciation. So, you all re receive one of these. <laughs> Can everyone see it? Dr. Perez, yes. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you. We, and we have carrying cases for these fantastic, phenomenal montages for you as well. Thank you so much. <laughs> he said, wow. <laughs> They're pretty, they're pretty impressive, if I do say so. <laughs> Thank you again. Okay, next I'm honored to introduce our next presenter, Tori Johnson. Tori is an activity manager in the Office of Education, Minority University Research and Education Project. He is coming to us from Goddard Space Flight Center. Tori? Thank you all very much. Good morning, and I appreciate the kind introduction. Today I'll be bringing some remarks on behalf of Mr. Mike Kincaid, the Acting Associate Administrator for the Office of Education, and Ms. Joletta Patrick, the Director for Minority University Research and Education Project. I've really enjoyed this rich STEM discussion today uh, during our Hispanic Heritage Month celebration here at NASA. As an organization, we are excited that STEM is indeed far-reaching and through the efforts of the Office of Education, we have been able to affect positive results across the country through our various initiatives. I'm going to spend a little time talking about a few of them, but I won't belabor your lunch. Uh, we'd like to share some exciting information with respect to some of the current Office of Education efforts. The first is regarding our NASA Internships, Fellowships, and Scholarships, or NIFs. Uh, NASA internships are available for educators, high school, undergraduate, and graduate students, and support educational opportunities that provide unique NASA-related research and operational experiences. 
NASA fellowships are competitive awards to support independently conceived or designed research or senior design projects by highly qualified faculty, undergraduate and graduate students, and disciplines needed to advance NASA's missions. We also have scholarships that are designed to provide financial assistance, as well as internship opportunities, uh, which are posted at intern.nasa.gov. Intern applications uh, for the spring session for 2018 are due next week, and the open session for summer 2018 begins on the 18th of October. So please share these opportunities with your friends and family and apply again at intern.nasa.gov. Uh, a second critical component of the Office of Education is the Minority University Research and Education Project, or MIRAP. Through MIRAP activities, NASA supports historically black colleges and universities, Hispanic serving institutions, Asian American and Native American Pacific Islander serving institutions, tribal colleges and universities, and other minority serving institutions through multi-year research grants. Additionally, MIRAP provides internships, scholarships, fellowships, mentoring, as you all discussed on the panel, and tutoring for underserved and underrepresented learners uh, in K-12 informal and higher education settings. Hispanic serving institutions, or HSIs, of which there are about 350 or more in total, account for approximately 42% of all MSIs in the country. In 2016, NASA spent over $59 million across these institutions. MIRAP also provides support and sponsorship for conferences that promote STEM awareness uh, across multiple demographic groups, such as Great Minds in STEM, the Society of Hispanic Professional Engineers, Women of Color in STEM, and the Society for Advancement of Chicanos and Hispanics and Native Americans in Science. An example of a dynamic NASA activity intersecting with the largest R1 institution serving a predominantly Hispanic student population can be found in the University of Texas, El Paso, and MIRAP Institutional Research Opportunity Center for Space Exploration and Technology Research. Say that again a couple of times fast. Uh, sorry for the acronyms. But this group out of uh, UTEP that's working with our MIRAP program continues its mission of creating an aerospace and energy research facility within a 21st century demographic institution. And lastly, I want to share a little bit about a really special activity, a year of education on station. This year, crews aboard the International Space Station, or ISS, will inspire more students and teachers than ever before. The year of education on station takes advantage of the unique capability of the space station to stimulate the interest of students from kindergartners to postgraduates alike. As a dream realized through innovation, hard work, and perseverance, and dedicated to the pursuit of knowledge, the station is a literal beacon for the entire education community of what can be achieved through learning. Among crew members aboard the station this year are two US astronauts who were teachers, Joe Acaba and Ricky Arnold. And you will actually see and hear from Joe shortly via a message from the International Space Station. These two former teachers will bring their experience in the classroom and passion for teaching during the year of education. Year of education activities include opportunities for hundreds of students and educators across the nation to speak directly with astronauts in space. Thousands more will participate through NASA partnerships with companies, learning centers, associations, universities, media organizations, and institutions, a whole lot of folks, and new educational demonstrations filmed in orbit and linked to life in space and human exploration will be unveiled and available to hopefully millions throughout the year. The ultimate objective is to inspire students in fields related to STEM, to help teachers stimulate the interest of their classes in these subjects, and ultimately through their students' pursuit of dreams to advance American achievement in discovery, invention, and exploration. You can find out how you can be a part of all of this and share NASA's year of education on station by visiting nasa.gov backslash education backslash on station. 
Now, as promised, uh, we now have some words directly from Joe Acaba from the International Space Station honoring Hispanic, Hispanic Heritage Month. Thank you very much. I'll leave it to Joe. Hi, everyone. I'm NASA astronaut Joe Acaba, currently living and working aboard the International Space Station. I want to take a moment to honor National Hispanic Heritage Month. I am proud of my Puerto Rican heritage and grateful for the opportunity to represent the Hispanic culture both on Earth and now in space. I want to pay tribute to the generations of Hispanic Americans who have reached for the stars and made accomplishments in many different fields, including the sciences and aerospace. I also want to recognize all the amazing and diverse members of the Hispanic community at NASA and elsewhere who have made it possible for me to fly in space and conduct experiments that can lead to innovations and breakthroughs that benefit everyone. Diversity is essential to our success, and I encourage all of you to use this Hispanic Heritage Month to learn a little more about the accomplishments and contributions Hispanics have made to your careers field specifically, and more broadly, to improve the lives of every one of us. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to say again, thank you so much for spending your morning with us. Uh, our current um, acting administrator, unfortunately, could not be here with us today, but he did want to say a few remarks. So that being said, uh, please welcome our, by video our uh, acting NASA administrator, Mr. Robert Lightfoot. Hello, everyone. I'm Robert Lightfoot, NASA's acting administrator. I'm sorry I was not able to attend this event in person but I wanted to take a moment to say thank you for attending our 2017 Hispanic Heritage Month event, Latinos STEM Up. At NASA, we welcome and celebrate diversity. It's essential to mission success. Hispanics have been and will continue to be an integral part of our workforce across every NASA center. The Hispanic community is the fastest growing population in our diverse nation, comprising almost 18% of our population and growing. Their engagement and contributions are essential to NASA continuing to inspire, explore our solar system, and look beyond it and, the, and achieve amazing things on behalf of the American people and the world. Today you heard from a stellar lineup of talent from across our agency and the nation about the importance of Hispanic representation in STEM education and STEM careers. Here at NASA, STEM is what we do. We hope to continue not only inspire future scientists and engineers, but also to train and develop the future leaders and decision makers of this great agency. I encourage students to continue to dream big and to one day join us on our mission of exploration. And because we want to continue being a leading and cutting edge organization, as leaders we must prepare both our current and future diverse workforce for the jobs of tomorrow. I look forward to us continuing this dialogue and working together to ensure we're breaking down barriers and reaching for new heights. I want to give a big thank you to the Hispanic Outreach and Leadership Alliance, also known as OLA, at NASA headquarters for planning and hosting today's program. Also, the Equal Opportunity and Diversity Management Division and Jay Hen, the Executive Director for Headquarters Operations. And of course, OLA's champion, NASA's Acting Deputy Administrator, Krista Paquin. The OLA leadership team is an example of how NASA employees go above and beyond to help us meet our missions and goals. They're all volunteers because they believe in the importance of diversity and inclusion. I thank OLA and the other employee research groups across our entire agency who work tirelessly to plan events and special programs and serve as advisors to senior leaders like me. Their efforts directly contribute to NASA being a great place to work. Thank you all for what you do. <laughs> 